In the struggle to survive, evolution has produced millions of creatures. Yet 99.9% .9 of them are extinct. What killed off the seemingly impregnable mammoth? Why did lethal predators like the saber-tooth perish? What destroyed the giant Irish elk? This series investigates six remarkable animals and the causes of their extinction. Was nature or man to blame? Were they unfit or just unlucky? Is the history of life on Earth really the history of death? September 1598, the crew of the Dutch East Indiaman, the Amsterdam, was saved from certain death. Hit by a savage storm off the Cape of Good Hope, they'd been blown into the uncharted waters of the Indian Ocean. By chance, currents carried them within sight of a tropical island. The men were half starved and the island promised food. But the sailors weren't the only two-legged creatures to have discovered this tropical paradise. encountered an extraordinary creature. They called it Dodarsen, the fat ass. Within 80 years it would be gone forever. We knew less about it than we did about the dinosaurs. Until now. In modern Mauritius, sugar plantations have replaced the jungle the Dutch explored. Tourists relax where the dodo once lived. But paleontologist Julian Hume is no tourist. He's here to discover what the dodo was like and what happened to it. The problem is, despite its fame, there is very scant evidence. Only a handful of rough sketches of living dodos were made. They were copied, often badly and incorporated into fanciful paintings, creating the enduring myth of a hapless bird. In Dutch art, the dodo is portrayed as a fat, clumsy, absurd species, the butt of jokes. It often appeared in fantastical landscapes, such as this one of Orpheus taming animals with his lute. It had become a mythical species on par with the griffin and phoenix, and that's partly why it became an icon of extinction. The dodo seemed so bizarre and comical but by the 18th century, some scientists doubted it had ever existed at all. When Lewis Carroll caricatured the dodo in Alice in Wonderland, the bird finally ended up more surreal than real. But ironically, around the same time, evidence was unearthed that proved it had existed. Dug up in 1865, these are the only complete dodo skeletons in the world. With them, Julian can separate fact from fiction and reconstruct what the dodo was really like. Now we have the skeleton of the dodo, we can tell so much more about the bird and how it may have appeared in life. It had a long, sinuous neck, quite an upright stance and probably stood about two and a half feet tall. This is very different from the picture that's come down to us from the early drawings. In popular imagination, the dodo is an inept, harmless creature. But the skull tells a different story. The most incredible feature about the dodo was this extraordinarily large head and bill. The horny tip would have been shed and regrown each year for feeding and for fighting. This would have made this bird very fierce indeed. 
Above all, the skeleton reveals that this bird was obviously flightless, had small withered wings, roughly the size of chickens, and to support this huge bulk, it needed strong, robust, sturdy legs. Yet one myth dies hard. The Dutch nickname Dod Arson, Fat Ass, seems to have been justified. Because dodos were flightless, they wouldn't have had breast muscles, the important power batteries for flight. So the actual chest would have been quite narrow, and all the weight would have hung underneath, concentrated on the bottom. But the skeletons tell us nothing about how the bird lived, what it ate, and why ultimately it died out. Pockets of native trees are rare amongst the sugarcane. But for Julian, they're precisely the kind of habitat that might have sustained the dodo. Tall and slender trees leave the forest floor open for feeding. This Mauritius dry forest was the dodo's world. It's where it fought, fed and bred. It was dominated by these wonderful trees such as ebony and also by a unique palm flora. These species produced prodigious amounts of fruit throughout the year and the forest floors would have been covered with them. Species such as hurricane palm, screw pines, bottle palms and of course ebony. This has almost certainly been the mainstay of the dodo's diet and armed with that huge bill it would have swallowed any of these whole. constantly on the lookout for fallen fruit, pouncing on it before competitors arrive. But the dodo may have hunted for other tasty morsels. Mauritius is a volcanic island and typically has acidic soil. These soils can often lack essential elements such as calcium. During the breeding season, dodos would have required extra amounts of calcium for the production of eggshell, and in order to supplement their diet, I think they would have needed much more than fruit. Snail shells would have provided a readily available calcium source in the ebony forest. All the evidence is helping to overturn the traditional view of the clumsy dodo. But this is only the start. Until this year, no one was even sure what kind of bird it was. Could it perhaps be a type of ostrich or vulture? The remarkable journey of one particular dodo is the key to solving this mystery. Back in the 17th century, reports of the dodo captured the imagination of Europeans. Dodo mania meant live specimens would fetch high prices. And the Dutch tried to ship them back to Europe. One made it all the way to London, where it was kept as a popular attraction, visited by the diarist Sir Heyman Lestrange. It was kept in a chamber and was a great fowl bigger than the largest turkey cock, but stouter and thicker and of more erect shape. The keeper called it a dodo. When it died, this dodo was stuffed and brought to Oxford. Unfortunately, in 1755, a spring cleaning museum curator threw most of the moth-eaten specimen away. By chance, the shriveled head and one leg were saved. Today, this is the only dodo skin tissue left in the world. Its lucky survival offers an amazing opportunity. Scientists can at last identify what type of bird the dodo actually was.
Dr. Beth Shapiro is extracting DNA from the lower leg of the Oxford bird. It's wonderfully exciting to be able to use DNA techniques to solve a question that's been plaguing naturalists and ornithologists since the dodo was first discovered. With the DNA that I managed to extract from the leg, I was finally able to confirm that the dodo is in fact a pigeon. The dodo is not a separate group at all, in fact belongs in the middle of the pigeons. But that isn't the only surprise. To discover where the dodo came from, Beth then compared the DNA to that of a range of modern African pigeons, because Africa is the nearest continental landmass to Mauritius. We were surprised when we finally got the results that it did not, in fact, come out closely related to the pigeons from Africa, but it was most closely related to a pigeon from Southeast Asia. The dodo's ancestor must have traveled 4,000 miles across the vast Indian Ocean to get to Mauritius. It's likely that the common ancestor of the dodo was probably from this area in Southeast Asia, because the majority of the pigeons that are in that group have ranges in this area at the moment. That ancestor probably made his way up here down the, in, down the coast of India here and through this range of sea stacks and volcanic islands, ridges all the way down here to Mauritius Island. When the dodo's ancestor reached Mauritius as much as 10 million years ago, it found pigeon paradise. It had no predators and no longer needing to fly, it evolved into a large ground-dwelling bird. Knowing it was a pigeon provides Julian Hume with a much clearer picture of how the dodo may have behaved. During breeding season, they would have been very aggressive towards each other. We believe that they had territories, and the males would have defended these territories in order to attract mates and have enough food for the young. Like other pigeons, males gather up nesting materials within their territory. They'll defend it noisily from all comers. When two superior males who possibly were fighting over the best territory fought each other, it would have been an amazing sight. There would have been bill tapping, squawking, and eventually that huge bill tip would have been used as a weapon. Males could do a lot of damage, but this time the newcomer relents. A female is attracted by the commotion. Pigeons have a ritualized display, and the dodo would have had a ritualized display on a grand scale. The male dodo would have puffed out its chest, and the forest would have resonated with its calls. This wonderful boo, doo, doo, doo. This male is trying to mesmerize his intended female. The female casts an eye over his nesting material. She'll build a nest in which she'll lay a single egg. The traditional image of the hapless dodo has been turned on its head by recent discoveries. And yet the dodo would soon meet its end. For the first time in 10 million years, it had to contend with a lethal predator. But what happened next is controversial. Did the Dutch really wipe out the dodo? In 1662, 64 years after the Dutch discovery of the island, a German called Volker Iverson was shipwrecked on Mauritius. He walked the length and breadth of the island, but saw no dodos. Hungry and weary, he wandered across to a small islet cut off at high tide. <laughs> this was the last dodo colony that humans ever saw. By the 1670s, within 80 years of its discovery, the dodo had undergone a devastating extinction.
but why? The traditional explanation based on misleading early artwork was that the dodo was simply inept, fat and easy to kill, an inadequate species. The Dutch only sent it to its inevitable doom. However, the latest scientific evidence reveals the dodo in a new light. It was not the clumsy bird of legend. It was a pigeon that had evolved over some 10 million years into a powerful, ground-dwelling creature. So what was the Dutch invaders' real relationship with the dodo? Did they hunt it to extinction? New archaeological evidence is throwing up more surprises. In 1638, the Dutch established a colony on Mauritius as a staging post on the spice route to the Far East. They called their compound Fort Hendrik. Around a hundred Dutch colonists logged ebony and maintained the small harbour regularly battered by cyclones. You can compare it to, uh, to a spaceship arriving from, uh, from another planet on a completely unknown planet and uh, bringing everything with them. Dutch archaeologist Peter Fleurer is now excavating a rubbish dump under the old kitchens to find out how the early colonists fed themselves. I was expecting to find thousands of dodo bones. Uh, maybe a little bit naive, but uh, on the other hand, because we didn't find any dodo bones over here, and still after uh, four, uh, four years of excavation, we haven't found any, uh, any dodo bones over here. Uh, you have to find an explanation for that. Could written accounts provide answers? Ship's logs tell us that the crew of the Amsterdam managed to kill a clutch of dodos in the two days following their discovery of Mauritius. The sailors were half starved after three weeks drifting across the Indian Ocean. But even so, the dodo didn't go down at all well. It was so tough, we could not cook it properly, but had to eat it half done. Through its oiliness, it cannot choose but quickly cloy and nauseate the stomach. Examining the skeleton, paleontologist Julian Hume sees why roast dodo would have been an unpalatable dish. The classic bird part that you eat is obviously the breast, but the dodo had no breast meat. So all of the meat and the fat would have collected on the rump. But this would have made it rather greasy and oily because there was no actual muscle. The legs would have been very muscular, but as the birds aged, they probably became very sinuous. And so you can understand why these early Dutch sailors did not like to eat them. Not only did the dodo make a poor meal, it could be awkward prey. Ship's logs describe tussles between sailors and aggressive dodos. They stress the bird could defend itself. They are superb and proud, very jaunty and audacious of gait. Their war weapon was the mouth with which they could bite very fiercely. So the case against the Dutch as perpetrators of extinction is looking suspect. If the Dutch didn't prize dodo as food, what else could explain the dodo's disappearance? There's a vital clue in the account of the shipwrecked Volker Iverson. When he stumbled across the last dodos, it was on an islet to the east of the main island. It could only be reached at low tide by wading through the shallows. This means that someone or something had driven the dodo off the mainland to this islet. Evidence emerging back at Fort Hendrick suggests what that may be. Peter Fleurer may not be finding dodo remains, but he is frequently digging up other non-native animal bones. We find so many bones, tens of thousands of, of bones of uh, non-indigenous species. The Dutch introduced all kinds of uh, animals and plants they thought 
uh, were useful for uh, for new ships coming in, like goats, like pigs. You can imagine that it must have brought uh, quite some harm to the uh, to the island. The introduction of uh, of all these uh, strange animals. Some of them broke loose, uh, raised their young in the wild. The forests were being invaded by these animal escapees. The dodo had to cope with new competitors, and in one important way, it was peculiarly vulnerable. Being flightless, the dodo raised its young on the ground. Julian believes the dodo was a victim of its own evolutionary success. Dodos evolved in isolation for millions of years. They never needed to get off the floor. There was no predators. They could have spent a long time rearing their young, perhaps one young every second year. There was no need to propagate themselves in any larger numbers. But then, sadly, pigs arrived. <laughs> Mauritius was more than a pigeon paradise. Its rich undergrowth also made it a pig paradise. Of all the animals the Dutch introduced, the impact of ground-rooting pigs on ground-nesting birds would have been devastating. Not only would the pig have competed for food, it may have disrupted age-old mating and egg-laying behavior. Here at last is a powerful explanation for the catastrophic disappearance of the dodo. Pigs would have ravaged the species on the mainland. Unable to rear young on the ground, the aging dodo population was driven to the coast and confined to islets such as the one Falkar Iverson stumbled upon in 1662. Isolated and aging, the last dodos faced oblivion. The dodo has this kind of awe about it. It is the extinct species of the world. The term dead as a dodo is often used in reference to it. In fact, this bird was a superior species, perfectly adapted to its environment. Its only downfall was the sheer weight of numbers and aggressiveness of introduced species were just too much for it. The story of the dodo's annihilation reveals how quickly extinction can overtake a species. And 400 years after it was first discovered, we at last know the dodo's extinction was simply a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Two books to accompany this series, Extinct, price £20, and Extinct Fact Files, price £6.99, are out now. And you can chat to producer and author Alex West and paleontologist Julian Hume right now at channel4.com forward slash talk. Majestic in design, ferocious in nature, deadly by instinct. It had the potential to be the most powerful hunting machine in the world. So why did the saber-tooth become extinct? Extinct, next Tuesday at 9 on 4.